so this talk will be based on joint work with the David, uh, Joseph Finwan, and Svalana Mayberoda. Okay, so let me first define the green function with pool at infinity. So let omega be an unbounded domain that satisfies some mild conditions. So let me, uh, so I will say the precise conditions later, but let me be vague right now. And let consider, so let L be an elliptic operator in divergence form. So this matrix A is just a matrix of real valued um, bounded measurable functions and satisfy this ellipticity condition. Then we can show that for any fixed point Z0 in the domain omega, there exists a unique function U that is continuous all the way to the boundary of the domain. And it solves this equation LU equals to zero in the domain omega. U is positive in the domain and it vanishes on the boundary of the domain. And uh, at the point Z0, U is equal to one. Okay, so we define this unique function U to be the green function with pool at infinity for the operator L normalized at the, at the point Z0 on the domain omega. As an example, let's consider uh, the upper half space as our domain. So, the, so this T is the transversal variable and let L be an elliptic operator with constant coefficient matrix. So A0 is any uh, constant elliptic matrix. Then we can check that the function T satisfy all these uh, conditions. And so the green function with pool and infinity for this operator in the upper half space normalized at the point zero one is just this function T. And if we normalize at different points, then the green function would just be some constant multiple of t. Okay, so in this example, we, we see that for a point on the upper half space, its distance to the boundary is equal to the function t. So we can say that for constant uh, elliptic operator, the green function with point and infinity on the upper half space is just equal to the distance function. So we can ask the following questions. The first one is on the upper half space, what is the optimal class of elliptic operators for which we have the green function with point infinity behaves like the distance function? Uh, and the second question is for this class of operator that we found in question one, what is the roughest boundary of a domain for which we still have the green function behave like the distance function. And of course, for both questions, we need to clarify what do we mean by the green function behaves like the distance function? How do, we, uh, how do we quantify this? So we give some answers to these questions. Um, so we will measure all these, so a lot of things in the sense of causal measures. So first, let me introduce the definition. Um, so for a point X on the boundary of the domain and the radius R, let's define the surface ball delta XR to be the intersection of the ball BXR and uh, the boundary of the domain. So this is delta, delta XR, the surface ball. And a non-negative Borel measure mu on the domain omega is called a Kaulson measure if it's a Kaulson norm is finite. So the Kaulson norm of the measure is defined to be this uh, ratio. So the mu measure of uh, the intersection of the ball with intersecting uh, the domain omega and the surface measure of the surface ball. And we take suprema over all such ball centered on the boundary of the domain. So if mu is a Kaulson measure, we will just simply write this. Okay. So now let's start with the case of the upper half space. We want to say that uh, the operators is close to some constant coefficient operator because from the previous example, we know that for a constant coefficient elliptic operator, the green function is equal to the distance function on the upper half space. So let's 
so we measure, so, so for any point on the boundary, so now it, this is the upper half space, so for any point X and every scale R, we're going to measure the difference between the coefficient matrix A and some constant matrix A0 by this number alpha XR. So alpha XR is just this L2 average of the difference of A and some constant uh, matrix in some Whitney ball. So WXR is a Whitney ball that is, uh, whose distance to the boundary is approximately R. And we take infimum over all the constant matrices, constant elliptic matrices, okay? So our condition on the operator is that this, so this quantity alpha xr squared dx dr over r is a Carlson measure on the upper half space. So we define an operator. We say that an operator satisfy the weak DKP condition if this is a Carlson measure on the upper half space. So remember that our definition, by the definition of Carlson measure, this essentially says that for any ball that is centered on the boundary of the upper half space, this integral, the R over R is bounded by some constant, some uniform constant times the Lebesgue measure of uh, the surface ball. So we see that in particular, this requires uh, this, alpha has to have some decay in R for this integral to be finite, okay? So the reason why we call this a weak DKP condition is because it's closely related to uh, the dalberg kanig pfeiffer operators. So this is, so the dalberg kanig pfeiffer condition is a condition introduced by Dahlberg and is shown to be sufficient for the LP solvability of the Dirichlet problem for some P greater than one by Koenig and Pfeiffer in 2001, which says that the gradient of the coefficient matrix squared times the distance to the boundary, and we take supremum of all the points in a Whitney ball. So this ball is a, um, centered at the point X, whose radius is one half of its distance to the boundary. So it's a Whitney ball for the domain omega. So this is a Carlson measure um, in omega. Okay, so this is the DKP condition. And our condition is uh, very similar to this one, but it's weaker because, so remember this is our number R fax R. And by the Poincaré inequality, we know that alpha xr is bounded by r times this integral um, of the uh, gradient square of the, of the coefficient matrix, and which is of course bounded by the supremum uh, of the gradient over a Whitney ball. And therefore our condition is uh, weaker than the DKP condition. And this is why we call it um, the weak DKP condition. Okay. So this is the class of operator that we are considering. Now, how do we, um, how do we say that the grain function is close to uh, the distance function? So we are not only comparing the grain function and T in this case, we are actually looking at the gradient, the, different of the, uh, the difference of the gradient of these two functions. And because we know that both of these functions vanishes uh, on the boundary of the upper half space. So considering the gradient is actually stronger than just comparing the difference of these two functions, okay? So for every point on the boundary and every scale R, we measure the difference um, of the gradient of the grain function and some constant multiple of the gradient of the distance function in this ball. So this is a half ball. So this is a ball centered at the boundary and we look at this difference um, as an L2 integral in this region. And we normalize this by the energy of the green function in the, the, in the same uh, half ball. And we take the infimum over all lambda. So lambda is any real number. So we take infimum over all uh, real number and we measure and we call this 
this number beta of XR. So this is how we measure the difference of the gradient of two. We measure this in every uh, scale R and on every point on the boundary. So in this joint work with Gita Vid and Savalana Mavaroda, we proved that if the operator satisfy the weak DKP condition on the upper half space, then this beta XR dx dr over R is a Carlson measure on the upper half space. And more precisely, we can control the Carlson norm of this by the Carlson norm of the alpha number. So this is the condition that we imposed on the operator that this is a finite number. So in other words, our theorem says that uh, how far the green function is from the distance function is actually controlled by how far the operator is from a constant coefficient operator. So let me say the main ideas of our proof. So we compare, so let's think this U as the green function with pool at infinity for the operator L. We compare this um, to a solution U0, which is a solution of a constant coefficient equation that has the same boundary data on a ball, on a half ball. So BXR, so, so on every point X on the boundary, and every scale r, we compare this green function with pool and infinity with this u0, they have the same boundary data on this half ball. Now, why is this, why is this u0 good? Because u0 is a solution to a constant coefficient equation, so it has very good irregularity, and the, the good irregularity of u0 gives us fast decay for the beta number of for, for u0. So more precisely, if we consider the beta number for u0 as scale tau times r for any tau that is between zero and one half, we can get a decay of tau squared here. So in other words, if we choose tau sufficiently small, we can actually get um, this would be smaller than one half of beta u0 at the scale r, which means that the beta number for u0 decays faster than a geometric uh, series. And therefore it has to be, so this one, so this means that this will of course be a causal measure on the upper half space. But remember we compare our solution to a constant a uh, solution U0 on every scale. And the reason is that we, we can control the difference uh, of the gradient of this two in any ball with radius R by this integral where we have the difference of the uh, coefficients operators. So the coefficients operator A, a and some constant uh, matrix A0 here. And then we can use um, a reverse holder type argument and, and some appropriate normalization, we can show that for some tau sufficiently small, we can get this decay estimate for the beta number for our solution U. But now we will pick up an additional term, which involves uh, the difference between the coefficient A and some constant coefficient matrix A, A0. Notice that this is not exactly, so this is not the same as what we defined uh, in alpha XR because this integral is an L2 integral over this ball all the way to the boundary. So this ball is a half ball on the upper half space. But in our definition for the alpha number, we only look at, at the difference in which new balls. But fortunately, we can show that the Carlson norm of this number, this quantity is actually controlled by the Carlson norm of this alpha number. So this is like a hardy, hardy type inequality. And from here, we can prove that uh, the beta number for U is also a Carlson measure on the upper half space. Okay, so a few remarks. So the first remark is that 
the class of operators that we are considering here is essentially optimal because we can construct an elliptic operator that does not satisfy the DKP condition and the corresponding uh, grain function is not a Carlson measure on the upper half space. And also, um, as a corollary of our result, we can use a Catropoli type argument to prove this second, this estimate for the second derivative uh, for the grain function. And we can also get a precise control of the Carlson norm of the second derivative by the Carlson norm of uh, the coefficients. And because we know that the cl this class of operator is preserved by a bi Lipschitz change of variable, we can extend this result to a Lipschitz graph domain. Okay, so then we want to extend our result to domains more general than Lipschitz graph domains. So the domains that we consider is, uh, is called Kordak domains. So I will need some definitions to define, so I will need two conditions to define Kordak domains. And these conditions come from the work of uh, Jarvis and Koenig in 1982. So the first condition is called the corkscrew condition. So a domain omega is satisfied the corkscrew condition if for any ball centered on a boundary with radius r, we can find a ball uh, contained in the intersection of this ball and the domain omega and whose radius is some uniform constant c times r. So the c will be uniform in all x and r. So this is the corkscrew condition. And the second one is called the Harnack chain condition, which essentially says that if we have two points in a domain omega, whose distance to the boundary is at least a row, and their distance is at most theta times rho, then we can find a sequence of Whitney balls that connects these two points. And the number of such balls is at most c times log of theta. So, and we say that a set is d-dimensional alphas regular if we can find some uniform constant c such that the d hausdorff measure of uh, the set E intersecting with a ball with radius R centered at the, at the set E is comparable to R to the power of D. And this constant is uniform in all X and R. Then we say that E is D dimensional R first regular. So with these definitions, I can define what a Kordak domain is. So a domain is a Kordak domain if the boundary is R first regular, and if domain, this omega satisfy the corkscrew and Harnack chain conditions, and, in, and the complement of the domain also satisfy the corkscrew condition. So we want to extend, like we want to get something which says that for uh, the class of operator that is satisfy some conditions similar to the DKP condition, we want to say that for uh, Kordak domains, we also have the green function uh, behaves like a distance function. But now we need an appropriate distance function because the boundary is now so rough that for the distance function, we know we only know that it's Lipschitz. But if we want to compare the gradient of the, the, this two, we just don't have enough regularity for this distance function. So we need an appropriate, another distance function that gives us enough regularity. So um, we use this regularized distance function, which is defined as this integral on the boundary. So for any positive number beta, we can define this function d beta, okay? And to, because we assume that the boundary is d-dimensional alphas regular, we can show that this function is actually comparable to the distance function. And this regularized distance function is introduced in this work of David and Finwan and Mebroda as a smooth re replacement for the distance function to prove Darburg's theorem in higher co-dimension. And they introduced this function because of the same reason, they need better regularity for, this, for the distance function. So with this, uh, the, the result, so joined with 
Joseph Fenwan and Spolana Mayberoda, we are able to prove that for elliptic operators that satisfy some weaker variant of the DKP condition, and in a quartile domain, we have a similar result, which says that the green function behaves like uh, the regularized distance, the distance function, in the sense that this is a Carlson measure in the domain omega. Um, so I think uh, I don't have time, so I would just stop here. And thank you for your attention. <laughs>